church and we're here to praise God. Looks like we moved our clocks forward and some probably forgot, but that's okay. We're here. We're going to praise God anyhow. And it's a wonderful day. You know, every time I come to church on Sunday, something new and something exciting happens. And the reason is because all of you are here and we are going to have church. We are going to pray together. We're going to have testimonies together. We're going to believe God for the miraculous and God is going to do some marvelous in your life. If you have your Bibles or your PDA instrument, phone, whatever you have, turn it on and open it up and stand to your feet and for the reading of God's Word. Romans 6, chapter 6 and verse 15. What, sh what then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obey the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time for the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. May we be doers of what you say to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. So I've entitled this talk, Slaves to Righteousness, or Sold Out for Jesus Christ. If you have a pen and paper, and there's also a part in your bulletin for you to write and take notes, I'd like to share with you three basic thoughts. So the first thought I'd like you to write down is, number one, be under the influence of God. Number one, be under the influence of God. Now notice in the scripture, you see the term slave used several times in scripture. And as we look at history, many of you are students of history, and many of you know what's happened throughout the world, you know, a few years ago, and a few hundred and thousand years ago. You know that, and I was thinking about this fact, that throughout the world, there have been examples and systems and institutions of slavery. You see slavery on the African continent where tribes enslaved other tribes. And then you see Europeans enslaved one another, then Europeans went to Africa and brought slaves over to the United States and to the Caribbean area and even to London. And then you've seen slavery exist in Asia, in China, in Japan, and in Russia. And as you study the history of the world, slavery has been around a long time. Now slavery, in my opinion, is a bad institution because it takes the rights of another human person, denies them of basic freedoms, and enslaves them, and they are no longer their own, but they are responsible to their master. 
Sometimes slaves are purchased. Sometimes slaves are like property sold to one person and is given to another person. So the Bible is using this metaphor of slavery to give us a picture of our spiritual condition. And to me, it's very interesting because a lot of us, when we became to, before we became to Christ, before we came to Christ and accepted him as our Lord and Savior, we were enslaved or controlled by the world system. The world system controlled us. It controlled our attitude, our minds, our thinking, between what was on the media, between what was on the social media and the TV and the newspapers and what our friends and neighbors and kids in our blocks all across the world were saying. And even here in America, we were going in a way that was contrary to what God, what God's agenda was for the whole world and what God's agenda more important for all of us here today. And so prior to coming to Christ, we all were living in some bad ways. And sometimes we like to sugarcoat the fact that we weren't a Christian, and we like to sugarcoat our pride life before Christ, and we try to make it seem like it wasn't that bad. Well, I didn't go murder anybody, or I didn't, you know, rob a bank and steal a million dollars, and I didn't stab somebody or kill somebody. And so I wasn't that bad of a person. And the things that I did that were outside of Christ, well, they weren't all that bad. The Bible describes our Righteousness is filthy rags. When it comes to God's standard of righteousness, the Bible describes as one great and humongous and big and righteous God in heaven, where he is in utter holiness and righteousness and purity and injustice, and that he looks at us as humanity involved in the things that we're involved in, and there was this big chasm or separation between him and us. And the only thing that can enable us to be into his presence was the was for someone, for us as human creation, to be declared holy and righteous. And we couldn't make that declaration of holiness and righteousness on our own. I remember as a kid growing up in New York City, even though I was a PK, a preacher's kid, I thought I was a good kid. I would go to church every Sunday. I would read the Bible. I would even go to Sunday school class. I would go to vacation Bible school during the summer. But when mom and daddy didn't see me, oh, I was bad. And I told you the story about the things I used to do and how I had an anger problem, the things I uh, was thinking, and I just was wanting things in my will all the time. And I knew within my heart that I was a bad dude, but I also thought in my thinking, because my dad was a preacher, that I was on my way to heaven. And you know what I used to do, Sister Carol? I used to think I could do anything I wanted to do, because my dad was a preacher, and I could just do whatever I wanted to do. That when it came time for me to enter heaven, Church of 
Jesus Christ worldwide. We have taken into the church. We brought into this fellowship, into this wonderful body, our tendencies from our past, which was of the flesh and which was pride of Christ, into our Christian living and our Christian experience. And we need to have a break. Everybody say break. We need to have a break with the past and embrace our today and our future. Now, if you were in class this morning an hour before church, we were dealing with the subject of the fact that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, hallelujah, the death of Jesus on the cross has significance for the Christian today because the Bible says in the same chapter of Romans 6 that we were buried with Christ when he died on the cross. Isn't that interesting? Why did the Bible, why did the writer of Scripture use such vivid language that we were buried with Christ? Well, the fact is we're all still living here. We're all still sitting here having our experience today. We're getting ready to leave and have a scrumptious cut of cake that we prepared for you. And a good meal. I mean, we're alive if you adopt the medical doctor. But the scripture says we were buried with Christ. What is the writer talking about? He was talking about the fact that when Christ died on the cross, in your mind's eye, see him there bleeding. In your mind's eye, see the people jeering at him. In your mind's eye, see the soldier that took the spear in his side and the blood comes out. And finally, in your mind's eye, picture Jesus saying, it is finished. His death and when they put him in the tomb, the scripture says we identify with that death. We identify with that crucifixion. And you and I should never, ever stop identifying with the death of Jesus Christ and with his resurrection. And here's how we are buried. Here's how we die. I'm not asking any of you to get on the cross. Jesus himself is not asking any of us to get on the cross and die a death like he died. But what he is asking is that you die to your old self and to your old fleshly ways that you had prior to Christ. And that now that you're alive, that you'll live the new life. Because in Romans 6 it says, we died and we were buried so that we will live a new life. The scripture, the scripture goes on to say in Romans, before we get to our specific scriptures that I read to you, it goes on to say that Jesus died on the cross once and for all. And you know what I'm saying to God? He will never, ever die again. And then it says he died once and for all. And even he, Jesus, lives a new life unto God. Now Jesus is our hero. If Jesus is the one that we live for our general, he is living a new life, a new life. Then you and I ought to live this new life. So you and I have to embrace something new every day as a Christian because God wants to do something rich in your lives this morning. And so what I came here today to tell you was as I was meditating on the scriptures that all of us together here are loved by God. Do you know how much you are loved by God? He loves you intently. He loves you immensely. We come to church sometimes and we come into the things of God and we read the Bible and we associate as believers and sometimes we get so transfixed about the problems that are existing, existence in the church that we don't we forget the fact that we are loved by God immensely. And just like a mother hen gathers her chickens unto herself, her chicks to herself, God through his Holy Spirit is gathering us to himself, to Christ, and he's telling me to tell you this morning that you are loved by God. Oh, it's not just a superficial love. It's not just an any love. It's a mighty love. Look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace. The measure of God's love for you right now is that he has given you his grace. Grace saved you by faith, and grace will sustain you in your Christian experience. Now notice that scripture says that you have access into this grace where you stand. You know what that's telling me? That on a continual basis, I have access to the love of God. On a continual basis, God is bestowing and giving his love to me. And it's a rich experience. It's not a mundane thing. Every day when I wake up, I love it the way Alvin, you said. That brother said when he puts, gets up in the morning, shakes himself, and he said before he puts his feet 
feet on the ground, he has made up in his mind that he's going to serve the Lord. Oh, I love that. When you get to the place where you may have heard a bad news the night before, you may have had a bad day the night before, you may have even had a bad night, but you have made up in your mind that you are going to serve God and that you are going to appropriate his grace in your life by saying, thank you, Jesus, no matter what the trial, no matter what the experience, because I know that your love is real and your word tells me, Romans 6, that I'm going to experience your grace each and every day and I'm getting a new measure, a new dose, a new dimension of your love in my life every day. And so for that, I'm excited. And that's why I started getting excited this week. I started thinking about all the things that I can do. And instead of me looking at my schedule these last seven days, thinking about, oh, I gotta do this for that person, I gotta be a prayer meeting this day, I gotta go to this meeting with the elders, I gotta do this. I almost like started thinking this way. I have an opportunity to be with another brother or sister. I have the opportunity to express God's love to them and them to me. And because of that exchange, that something new is happening in my life every day. It's going to be the most best day of my life. And so this week has been great. It energizes me so much on a spiritual level. Like I told you earlier, I got up and went to the gym five times. Now my routine is normally about three, but I was feeling so good I went to the gym five times. And as I was at the gym, I was just praising God. It was just helping get through the treadmill and the uh, elliptical machine a little bit better and a little bit faster because I had the Lord on my side and he was blessing me. So this verse here in chapter 5 of Romans says that we have gained access by faith into his grace. And that grace is mention of his love for us. And then verse, verse 5 also says, and hope does not disappoint us. Because God has poured out whatever, his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. See, that new life that you and I are living every day, it's being poured into us. It's being downloaded into us. It's coming to us even in the midst of a bad report that we receive. His love is just downloaded into our spirits. And when it downloads into our spirits, then we can let it overflow to somebody else. Say amen. And then look at verse 15. But the gift is not like the trespass, for the many died, but the trespass of the one man. How much more, here it is, did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. So that grace just keeps coming your way. It keeps coming your way. It keeps blessing you. And so I want you to know that you are loved by God. His grace is sustaining you. What is grace? Grace is God's unmerited favor. Grace is his blessing to God, his personal postcard, his personal message, his first, his personal dispatched anointing and virtue from heaven that's coming your way to bless you and to keep you, even though you go through the stuff of life. Let the church say amen. amen. So point number one is be under the influence of God. Why? Because you're loved. Be under the influence of God. Why? Because he cares for you. Be under the influence of God. For what you yield to, you obey. Look at uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. So when you are under the influence of God, you are going to find yourself obeying God. See, the church, the problem with the church is that sometimes the problem with Christians and believers, no matter what the church is, we get out of sync with God and stop experiencing his love and don't allow his grace to be poured into our hearts. And then we get into the areas of sin because we are not following God because we forget that he loves us and he cares for us. And our obedience is not under compulsion, but our obedience should be out of love. I had my daughter uh, spend the night with uh, my granddaughter. Spend the night with me. I don't have the dogs. <laughs> spend the night with me this weekend. And Trish is wore out because we had our granddaughter spend the night with us. And it was just fun. And Timothy and Alicia, my son, uh, and his wife also. And it was so wonderful. Amila, she's now, how old is she? She's like four. Yeah, she's four. Amila was there and she loves it when I 
allowed her to jump on me. No, when, uh, yeah, when I allowed her to jump on me, she just likes to do a running jump. So I have to kind of protect myself a little bit. She just runs up, just runs into me and jumps on me. And then she likes me to swing my legs up and down while I'm in a sitting position. Because then she jumps up in the air when I swing my legs up and she jumps down. And so we go through this little charade back and forth. She's laughing and she's having a good time. And she said to me, she said, I like it, Grandpa, when you do that. And so we and I the whole afternoon just going back and forth, doing this little routine. And I'll be asking her questions. And she goes, I like it, Grandpa, when you do that. And then she asked me to get her some drink, and I got her something to drink. And she asked me to get her something to eat. And I, she goes, Thank you, Grandpa. And we just have this thing going back and forth. And now she's a little, she's a little rambunctious too, because she was a little girl. Remember the church that I brought that Sunday, and I said she was dealing with the word no, and then right in the church, she goes, no, you know. So she'll tell you no in a minute. Oh yeah, she has some personality. But we have this thing going back and forth with each other, where she loves me, and I love her. And I know this Mike, my other son Michael was here this morning. By the way, Michael got healed of his surgery. And he Praise God for that. And so Amala has a shared relationship with Mike. You know, Mike and her going back and forth. He's saying things to her. And there's this love relationship. And so we like being in each other's company, me and Amala. Michael likes being in Amala's company because we love each other. And because we love each other, and here's the kid. We do things for each other. When Mala asks me to get something and get us some food, I do it. It's not like, oh, so I get it up. I do it joyfully because I love my grandkids. And Michael does the same thing. And you and I, because God has downloaded his love to our hearts, our obedience to him comes naturally, and we find that we have more victory over sin. And so no longer we are slaves to the old self, but we're living more in the new life, in the new self that God has appointed for us. Amen? You have your pen right now, point number two. Become a slave or servant to righteousness. Point number two, become a slave or a servant to righteousness. Look at Romans 6, 19. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves, just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness. And look what it says happening. Leading to what? Holiness. Isn't that beautiful? Because the term slave is not a good term for people who have been oppressed. Don't you go up to somebody who just got free and say, now you to offer yourself as a slave. You get punched in the face. <laughs> so it's a tough term, isn't it? But when you become in love with Jesus and you realize the depth of his love, and thank you, thank you, thank you, Courtney, for the songs that you led us in about the cross and about his death and what it means for us, because when you understand, understand the dimension of what he did for us and how much he loved us, hey, then you just want to give it up for the Lord. You want to serve him. You want to offer yourself even as a slave. That means that you become so in love with Jesus that when he asks you to do something, you are willing to do it. Amen. When he asks you to do something, you are willing to do it. Now here's the time of the service when I, I do this every so often, I'm going to do it this morning. And I call it the Q&A, question and answer time. So here's the question. You can just answer. You can just give me one sentence answers. If you think you have an answer, if you don't have anything you want to say, don't feel like you have to say anything. But if you want to answer this question, I just want you to answer this verbally right now. What are the ways that we can offer ourselves to God? What are the ways that you and I can offer ourselves to God? Anybody? Perfect. To serve others. Wow, that's a big one. Anybody else? Say that again, Carol. Give our lives to the Lord. That's where it starts. When you give your heart to the Lord and say, Jesus, be my Lord and Savior, forgive me my sin, that's a mighty good thing you can do. Some of you this morning may need to say that prayer. And at the end, I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you have not really, really, really given your heart to the Lord, you know, or if you've done it and you know you have gone back on your commitment, then you need to be up this morning to do that. Anybody else? How can we off? Yes. Be in the Word and do what it says. 
Be in the Word and do what it says. Be in the Word. That means this book called the Bible, that you open it up and read the Bible, study it, meditate upon it, and then do what it says. Anybody else? Yes. Praise God. Examine yourself according to God's standard of righteousness and make sure you please Him. Not yourselves. Anybody else? Listen and obey. Listen and obey. Good word. Anybody else? These are all the thoughts. Hi. Say it again, Sam. Ooh, our finances. The scripture tells us to bring an offering unto God. Important. Yes, Brother John. Believe it. Believe it. Oh, what a great word. Brother John, can you give me a cup of water? Sure. Believe it. That, that is so important. Believe it. Sometimes we just go without Christian experience, just go on through motions. What we hear is just going in one ear, going out the other. When you really believe it, oh, that's something good going on. Anybody else? These are all excellent things. Now I want you to turn to Romans, same book, chapter 12, and verse 1 and 2. This really gives us a key. Thank you so much, John. Really appreciate that, brother. On how to offer ourselves to God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, King James says, I beseech ye therefore. And this says, therefore I urge you, brothers, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Now notice it says to offer your body as a living sacrifice. Now if you look and study Old Testament history and Old Testament practice, they had to offer a animal sacrifice to the priest as a sign or in response to this sin, and they had to bring this before the priest, and then he would go to God and pray for you that your sins would be given. Now, when you brought that sacrifice, it was alive. That lamb or that goat was alive and squawking, but by the time the priest was done with it, that animal was dead because the priest had to kill the animal. And the blood was put on the altar. That was the sacrifice. So why would Paul use offer yourselves as a living sacrifice? Why would he use such terminology when the word sacrifice means to die? So the question is, here we are in the Q&A again. What does he mean when he says offer yourselves as a living sacrifice? How can that be? It seems like this is a, this is a, this doesn't make sense. This is a canonical. Yes? Well, in Philippians, it talks about who really are in grace. And in terms of their gifts and such, they are all living creatures. Wow. So we listen to that kind of gift. Wow. Wow. So our will becomes his will. We're still alive, but it's the surrendering of our children. That's the key. And so we're still alive, but we become dead to the old self. If you were in class this morning, we talked about what that meant. You don't physically die, but you allow the body of sin not to control your life anymore. So you don't have to get up anymore. And when your neighbor says something you don't like, you don't have to slap them in the face anymore. Say amen. <laughs> That's a pretty graphic example, isn't it? But you don't have to do it. You can substitute what it is you have as weakness in it. God wants you to have strength so you can be a living sacrifice. Now what else does it say? Holy and pleasing to God, for this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, when you get into the word, you allow your mind to be renewed. This is how you offer yourselves to God, say to God. It's just not something you can just think and it happens. But when you when you precisely and intentionally open up the word of God and allow the word to speak to your heart, and then you live by it, and like what you said, Sharon, and you do it, oh my goodness. You are going to be blessed. The result of offering ourselves to God is that it will lead to holy living. Turn to Hebrews 12, 14. Hebrews 12, 14. We're almost done. Well, 
Well, I had the first read it. Hebrews 12, 14. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy without holiness. No one will see the Lord. Isn't that something? Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Do we get to be holy on our own efforts? Talk to me. Mm -hmm. Was anybody born holy? Talk to me. How do we become holy? Through Jesus Christ. Yes, I love it, Veronica. Through Jesus Christ. When you and I say yes to Jesus, he immediately declares that you are holy. Isn't that wonderful? Now here's the key. You and I need to walk in our holiness. Stop walking in the flesh. Walk in that new life. Walk in that holiness. Say amen. amen. Point number three, if you have your pens, write this down. Holy living leads to eternal life. Write this down. Holy living leads to eternal life. Turn back to Romans chapter 6, and let's look at verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap <clears throat> leads to holiness. And the result is eternal life. And in this famous verse, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that wonderful? See, you and I, if I were to ask you the question, where are you headed? Most of us should say heaven. If I were to ask you the question, what's your end game? Most of you should say heaven. If I would ask you, where do you want to die? Where do you want to go when you die? All of us should say, I want to go to heaven. Everybody say heaven. Heaven. Will everybody go to heaven? Everybody on the planet right now? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Only those who accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And it's our job to get as many people saved as possible. It's our job to tell as many people so that God will save them. We don't do the saving. God does the saving. But we are the ambassadors of truth. So our walk, in essence, is a walk toward heaven. It's a walk of holiness. And it's a walk that leads to eternal life. Does eternal life start tomorrow? Talk to me. Or does eternal life start now? It starts now. So I'm living in my eternal life. See the, you see the perspective? But if you were to remove time from the equation, eternal life is not March the 9th or March the 11th. Eternal life is 11.30 right now. And eternal life is walking in holiness. Because when I get to heaven, when I get to heaven, this is all coming up, but I won't sing it for you. When I get to heaven, now this is a deep theological question. And this is pointed to the people that were in class this morning. So I'm sorry, y'all. I'm just eliminating y'all from the answers. When I get to heaven, or anybody can answer this question if you want. Will you be able to sit in heaven? When I get to heaven, when you get to heaven, will you be able to commit any sin in heaven? No. No. Ah, uh, you got it right. You got it right. When we get to heaven, <laughs> no possibility of you sitting in heaven. It's removed. So you and I need to act like it now. Now we're going to sit on this side of glory. Yeah. Yeah, we're probably going to sit. But our goal is to start acting and getting ready for that eternal state that we're going to be in, which is perfection and holiness and righteousness that God gives to us. So our heavenly walk starts now. Let's wait till we get to glory to start acting like a heavenly dweller. We start to bring the heaven down on earth because Jesus said that will be done in heaven. How did I say it right? Did I say it right? That, that, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <laughs> it's all right. <clears throat> so you and I need to start walking our eternal walk of holiness. Oh, this is right inside. Because now you and I have another seven days. I don't know why we live in seven days, but I will. Because the next seven days we're going to come back again. And so these next seven days, and it starts today, it starts right now. Go get your piece of cake. 
And you can't eat cake, it's carrots in the refrigerator. That's burnt beef. Eat three pieces of cake. <laughs> we have that much cake, eat three pieces. <laughs> so if you eat your piece of cake, since you leave today, I want you to tell me next week, because I'm telling you a week in advance, it's going to be testimony Sunday. I'm going to give you these five new examples to tell how you are walking in your new life. See, the problem is we have, we have diminished the life, the new life that Christ has for us each and every day, and we keep focusing on the path. We focus what we've done to us. We focus what they did to me, and let's focus in on the new life that Christ has for us. And as we walk in this new life, we walk in victory. Let the church say amen. Please stand to your feet. A very solemn moment right now. Mass every head to be bowed. Some of you heard what I said about the gospel message. And so I have two important questions to raise to you. Two important questions. The one question is, are you saved? Are you living for God? If you were to die right now, would you make it to heaven? And the second question for many of you that are believers is, what is hindering you? What is binding you? Stop it. And you need to release it this morning. This is your day of release. This is your day of victory. So for those in the first position, every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm asking some of my leaders to keep your eyes open because we want to be praying for you and give you a book that you can grow in your walk with the Lord. If you do not know Jesus as your Savior, just raise your hand. We're going to go to the other one. Just raise your hand. And we're going to pray for you and ask God to bless you. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, just raise your hand. We want to pray. If you don't get ashamed, this is your time for victory. This is your time for deliverance. Don't get ashamed. The Holy Spirit's calling you. Courtney, if you just play something quietly. If you need to ask Jesus to come into your heart, you know if you're going to leave this place, this is your day. Raise your hands so I can see it. We just want to lead you in a prayer. Don't be ashamed. That's the first group. The second group is if you are a Christian and you've been having areas in your life that have been binding you and you need to be set free, raise your hand. I want to pray for you. A prayer to be set free. Yes, I see several hands. Don't be ashamed. This is your time to get free, to be free in Jesus, to be free in Christ. And as you're raising your hand, as you're believing God for the victory, he's doing it right now. Heavenly Father, thank you. For the mission of several saints who raise their hands and wants to be set free. Your word says, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And Jesus, you came to free us from those things that the enemy has put in our paths. So in the name of Jesus Christ, I declare freedom and I declare deliverance.